Welcome everyone and good evening. It's nice to be here, isn't it? Out and about every now and then. Yay. <laughs> well, um, for those I don't know, I'm Dan Lewin. I'm the CEO of the museum. Um, this is the second time since we've kind of opened up that I've been able to welcome a crowd to a program. I, in my four years here at the museum, half the time has been sheltering in place. So it's, there's this great feeling now that's emerging. So. Um, our goal, obviously, with these programs is for you to walk away with a new perspective and vantage point and, uh, and to learn. And um, we couldn't do these programs without the generous support of our donors, our trustees, and sponsors. So there's a little QR code on the program if you're so interested where you could you know, click and join and consider giving or becoming a member of the museum. So we appreciate that uh, to the extent uh, you are capable and willing. We'd appreciate it. So thanks so much for that. Um, this is a, a special program in many, many ways. Uh, over the last few years, while we've been sheltering in place, we have been working diligently uh, to help realize our mission and purpose, which we revised with our trustees uh, going back a couple, two years plus, and that is to decode technology, its computing past, the digital present, and the future impact on humanity. And I can't think of a better program or opportunity to celebrate that past, present, and future conversation than the one we're going to enjoy tonight um, discussing Stuart Brandt as an individual who uh, was ever present uh, in the Bay Area and in general in the culture in a manner that is in many ways uh, in almost like a Forrest Gump-like way. He was there always in, in this various different place. So if you haven't read John's book, uh, you should, uh, and uh, if you don't know much about Stuart, you'll walk away with your head spinning. So I'd like to take a moment, uh, introduce Marguerite Gong Hancock, who's the VP of Innovation and Programming at the museum, and she'll kick off the program. But again, it's my pleasure to welcome you all back to CHM, and so thanks for coming tonight. Thanks so much, Daniel, and I want to add my warm welcome to each and every one of you who is joining us, whether in person here or online. Well, tonight's program is, as Daniel said, focusing on the many lives of Stuart Brand, who over the past six, six decades has influenced revolutions that have touched really so many aspects of our lives. And uh, tonight at CHM, we're going to focus especially on his role as he heralded the beginning of the valley and also influenced its soul uh, through uh, impacting a generation of people who were readers of the whole Earth Catalog. And we're in for a treat because the person telling the story of Stuart, not only on stage tonight, but in this important new biography, is none other than John Markoff. Now, John doesn't need a lot of in introduction, but he is a Pulitzer Prize journalist, uh, uh, acclaimed author and a longtime friend of the museum. And by the way, he started his research when he was staff historian here at the museum five years ago. Our event will have several parts. First, we'll hear from John about some of the core ideas and stories of the book. Then author and journalist Nicole Perloff will join him here up on stage. And you'll have a chance to add your questions into the conversation, use your Q&A cards, and people in the staff will, will share them with Nicole. Finally, after the program, John will be downstairs signing books. John uh, has given us hot news over the years. I remember when he first wrote the account of the World Wide Web or broke the news about the Google self-driving car. He's also been a very thoughtful chronicler and interpreter of the long arc and kind of driving, imp driving uh, drivers of, of uh, Silicon Valley as well as technology and society. So I'd like to introduce him as a CHM tradition through five numbers. 3,000 plus tech articles written for the New York Times. 1993, the year he first wrote the piece, first ever piece on the World Wide Web. Six books written on the history of people and their relationship with computers. Four Pulitzer Prize nominations before winning in 2013. And 45 years writing about technology and science for the Pacific News Service, San Jose Mercury News, and the New York Times. John, it's always wonderful to have you here at CHM. Welcome back. <laughs> That's great. Hey, everyone. Um, let me, I, before I get going, I want to start uh, to thank the museum um, 
as Marguerite said, for supporting me during the first year I was writing on this book, and particularly uh, to the former director, John Holler, who was the one who hired me to work as a staff historian for a year. Um, so the subtitle of my biography is The Many Lives of Stuart Brand. But I, tonight, before I talk with Nicole, I just want to uh, highlight one of them. Um, I want to introduce you to Stuart visually, perhaps reintroduce you, and um, mention one thing that surprised me in my research and actually reframed the way I think about the, re the relationship between Silicon Valley and, and uh, the whole of the catalog. Um, so um, Stuart, of course, is best known for the catalog, um, which initially appeared really just briefly from 68 to 71, fall of 68 to 1971. There were two issues a year. There were two supplements because he wanted it to be interactive. Um, the supplements were sort of his reader's response to the catalogs. And um, during that time, almost three million copies were printed. Um, it won the National Book Award in 1972. One of the judges said that he thought that the catalog would be the only book that was published in 1971 that people would remember 100 years from then. I think that's actually possible. But, and, and you know, the contest, it was this wonderful so mosaic of crazy stuff, all the way from whole systems thinking to learning, everything in between, how to make granola, um, computers, the whole thing. But tonight, I really wanted to talk more about the where than the what, and sort of think about the fact that the catalog appeared first in Menlo Park, just up the street from here. Um, if you put a, a stake, in 1965, um, it, in the ground at Kepler's and drew, drew a circle around it about two miles, you would have encompassed everything that was important in the computing world. And you know, I think of Silicon Valley um, in the way I think about places like uh, Florence at the start of the Renaissance, uh, Vienna, perhaps before World War II. There are certain places in the world where uh, politics and technology and culture all collide and the world changes. And I think that decade in Silicon Valley was one of those times and one of those places. Um, Doug Engelbart's lab at SRI uh, appeared in 62. At, in the same year, John McCarthy's lab, the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Lab, was created on the other side of Stanford campus um, on Arrastadero Road. Xerox built a laboratory in 1970, the Palo Alto Research Center. Um, Bob Albrecht, uh, a, a, a mainframe programmer set up a computing uh, resource called the People's Computer Center in the early 1970s. Um, and of course, in 75, the Homebrew Computer Club emerged. Um, so the Whole Earth Catalog Truck Store, or the Whole Earth Truck Store, um, plopped down right in the middle of that in, in the summer of 1968. But around the corner was uh, the Mid Peninsula Free U headquarters. Um, the Free U went from Nobody to 50,000 students from sort of 69 to 71 and then back to zero in two years. Um, there was this interesting organization created by some elect electrical engineers mostly called the International Foundation for Advanced Study that popped off up also just off of um, Santa Cruz. Uh, and it was there from 62 to 66. And it took probably almost 500 people through a very intense LSD experience. The engineers believed that there was a connection between LSD and creativity, and they wanted to prove it, and Stuart was one of their first subjects. Um, there were these communities. Um, Perry Lane, of course, went all the way back to the turn of the last century, and Kesey famously lived there. These bohemian communities, but also there was Homer Lane off of Alpine Road as you go out to Port Port Portola Valley, and a bunch of the the writers that were in the Stanford writing program lived there, and Stuart lived there during that period. The Briar Patch Market uh, emerged there. So I can't begin to, descri to describe to you how different the Mid Peninsula was in, in the mid 60s and the early 70s to the, uh, to the current post dot com era. Um, Lois Jennings was Stuart Brand's first wife. She was a half audio Ottawa Indian who was employed by the Office of Naval Research. She was a genuine hidden figure. She took a college course in programming supercomputers. And she was actually a co-founder of the Whole Earth Catalog. Everybody got paid exactly the same amount. It didn't matter what they did. Um, they got $5 an hour. Uh, Stuart got $5 an hour. I got $5 an hour. 
uh, Bernie Sprock, who was our high school student who came to work and sweep up as long as he got to keep all of the stamps. Um, he got $5 an hour. It didn't really matter. Um, but this was, even at the time, a pretty low wage. So the catalog, of course, was actually a pivot. What Stuart first set out to do with Lois uh, was create a truck store. He, his original idea was to drive out to the communes and help his friends who were setting up the communes by bringing them books and tools. And he made a couple of trips during the summer of 1968, and he immediately realized that wasn't going to work. His friends had no money. And so he pivoted, and he produced the catalog. And what's significant is that ultimately in that period, it reached a much broader generation, a much wider audience than it did than just the back to the land community, um, including this man. When I was young, there was an amazing publication called the Whole Earth Catalog, which was one of the Bibles of my generation. It was created by a fellow named Stuart Brand, not far from here in Menlo Park, and he brought it to life with his poetic touch. This was in the late 60s, before personal computers and desktop publishing, so it was all made with typewriters, scissors, and Polaroid cameras. It was sort of like Google in paperback form 35 years before Google came along. It was idealistic, overflowing with neat tools and great notions. Stuart and his team put out several issues of the Whole Earth Catalog. And then, when it had run its course, they put out a final issue. It was the mid-1970s, and I was your age. On the back cover of their final issue was a photograph of an early morning country road, the kind you might find yourself hitchhiking on if you were so adventurous. Beneath it were the words, stay hungry, stay foolish. It was their farewell message as they signed off, stay hungry, stay foolish. And I have always wished that for myself. And now, as you graduate to begin anew, I wish that for you. Stay hungry, stay foolish. Thank you all very much. So that was Steve speaking to the 2005 Stanford commencement. Um, it's now been viewed several hundred million times. Um, I thought it might be the most viewed uh, YouTube video of all time. Um, silly me. I, I, I learned about baby shark dance, um, <laughs> which, which has been viewed more, than there are, more times than there are people on the face of the earth. Um, but nevertheless, the, the philosophy and the worldview of the catalog had a significant impact on an entire generation. It wasn't about digital technology, but it was pro-appropriate technology. The Whole Earth Catalog was the Moby Dick of access. What's number two at that era? There's the Sears Catalog? Well, I didn't need a dress, you know, uh, <laughs> but I needed to know how to drill it well. So that was Jameis McNiven, the founder of Bucks, which is the celebrated uh, uh, restaurant in, in Woodside. He was a, I ran into dozens of people like Jameis who stumbled across something in the catalog and their life went in an orthogonal direction. Um, he was a committed catalog reader. He was selling dairy equipment in Connecticut one winter. And he came home and he couldn't find his home because there was so much snow. And so Jameis decided it was time to move to California. And he got here and he used the catalog to become a contractor. Um, his first job, major job, was working for a young CEO by the name of Steve Jobs in Los Gatos. Um, it didn't go well, asked Jameis. Um, so something remarkable happened in 2016. Um, around that election, the zeitgeist on Silicon Valley really flipped. And Silicon Valley really overnight went from being able to do no wrong to do no right. And, um, these two books encapsulate that sort of shift in view. Uh, both are accounts of the nightmare of, of social media and how it affected democracy. And they share one thing in common. Um, they both begin with a biographical sketch of Stuart Brand. Um, the implication, of course, is the whole earth catalog in some way was the root cause of the consequences uh, of the modern internet. And 
I think that I discovered um, that the opposite is actually the case, and so let me explain. Um, Stuart Brand is not a technologist. Um, however, he was involved. Um, this is his dorm room at Stanford in 1957, and that's a phone booth. And if you look down on the bottom right, you'll see some things that are actually resistors. And if you, at that point of time, connected a resistor to the uh, handset in a particular way and connected it to the wall, you could get a free phone call. It was called the Phone Freak Community. And to learn more about it, you need to read Ron Rosenbaum's piece in, the, in, in Esquire called The Secrets of the Little Blue Box. But it was the path into what became the computer hacker community of the 60s. Um, for Stuart, he stumbled into the world of computing first at Pine Hall on the Stanford campus in 1962. He was just out of the army. He had been a lieutenant. He was trying to become a photographer. And uh, his first paying assignment was uh, the architects of the Trestor Student Union, then brand new Trestor Union, hired him, hired him to take photos of their, of their building. And he was getting a tour of campus. And the Pine Hall Computation Center was then brand new too, 1961 and had been built. It had a PDP-1 computer inside it. And on his tour, he saw two young men playing Space War, which then was, of course, the first video game. And he realized immediately they were having what he thought of as an, as an out-of-body experience, um, what we would now call uh, cyberspace or the metaverse TM. Um, and he filed this notion away and came back to it about a decade later. Um, so what really reframed the way I think about Stuart uh, came when I found this journal. Um, Stuart had given most of his journals to Stanford in 2000. And both Fred Turner, who was writing from counterculture to cyberculture, and I was working on what the Dormouse said, we were both in there immediately and read Stuart's journals. And I was kind of disappointed because I was looking specifically, Stuart, of course, had run the camera for Doug Engelbart uh, during the, the demo that was it would later be called the Mother All Ball Demos by Stephen Levy. And I was looking for his reactions, and I found nothing on it. It was the late 60s, and most of it was about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, but when I started the project in 2017, he gave me another journal, a journal that he hadn't given to Stanford. Um, Stuart, as luck would have it, was a bit of a pack rat. Um, he just threw stuff for literally decades into a shipping container on the uh, waterfront in Sausalito. And then in 2000, the Stanford librarians and they came and took almost everything. Except what they didn't take was still in his storeroom on Gate 5 Road. And he pulled out a separate journal that was an account of his effort to create a technology fair, an educational technology fair. Um, in 1967, he was hired by his mentor, a man by the name of Dick Raymond, who had created the Portola Institute, was, which I would argue was the Valley's first incubator. And he spent a half a year working on this educational technology fair, trying to raise money, and he failed. Uh, the project never happened. It was supposed to be at the San Mateo County Fairgrounds. If you read the funding proposal, what's just remarkable about it is, is it reads exactly like what the Maker Fair began. Of course, it happened 40 years later at the San Mateo County Fairgrounds. But it didn't work. Um, but what was significant for me is that here we are in 1967, and all Stuart Brand's friends are going back to the land. And Stuart instead, intend, it's instead shows up with his, in, his intent to let my technology happen here, Menlo Park. So it's almost spooky. I mean, Silicon Valley wouldn't be named for four more years. But all the forces that would become Silicon Valley were at play in the second half of the 60s. And Stuart Brand showed up right in the middle of it. Um, so. Uh, Second. So in, in reading that journal, it's not just this remark, which is so striking, but I got a portrait of how close he was to Engelbart during that year before he created the catalog. Um, he was trying to persuade Engelbart to exhibit at the technology fair, and Engelbart was trying to persuade Stuart to join what he'd called his augmented human intellect community. And out of that, Stuart learned about microelectronics. He learned about scaling. And in fact, he became an, almost an acolyte for Engelbart, much more so than he remembers. But I can see it in the journal. Stuart literally at one point went up to lecture on computers on the Kesey farm in Oregon. Um, 
And so, you know, the subtitle to this catalog was Access to Tools. And if you ask Stuart today, where did that come from, he'll tell you, well, I was simply channeling Buckminster Fuller. Fuller, of course, famously said that um, if you want to change the world, give someone a tool and teach them how to use it. But if you think about it, Doug Engelbart was at work designing the universal tool. And, and Stuart learned about that very early, and it shaped his worldview. It filtered into the catalog, and it filtered out into an entire generation. And so the early impact of the catalog co-evolved with what was becoming Silicon Valley. And that was something that I didn't expect. Um, you know, when, when people uh, talk about Stuart as being zealot-like or being a Forrest Gump, this is the classic photo. Um, here he is running the camera in Menlo Park. Um, what happened was that Bill English, who was Doug Engelbart's chief engineer, the co-inventor of the mouse, um, wanted Stuart to come in and help because Stuart had created this multimedia presentation when multimedia was three, um, three projectors and one slide, slides, uh, one screen, um, to come in and help with the design of the project. But in fact, his time as a camera operator was really a footnote. The interesting thing was his relationship to, to, um, to uh, Engelbart. Um, Three years later, he took what he had seen a decade earlier at um, Pine Hall, and he approached Jan Wenner, who was the uh, editor and publisher of uh, the Rolling Stone, and he wrote a piece about stuff happening at the Stanford Artificial Intelligence Laboratory and at Xerox Park. Um, space War had just come out into the world. If you went to Stanford Trust Union in 1971, there was a coin-operated video game that came out at the same time as Nolan Bushnell's first game called C Computer Space. It was the first sense that any of us had that there would be an impact of these interactive technologies. And this is sort of the best example of brand as messenger. That article in the Rolling Stone was really the first hint that uh, these technologies, personal computing and networking, were going to reach a much broader part of the world. Um, the article began, ready or not, computers are coming to the people. That's good news, maybe the best news since psychedelics. <laughs> um, and it was, people like, it was how people like me learned that personal computers were on the horizon. Um, two years later, he took two of his articles, the, the one in the Rolling Stone and another one about Gregory Bateson that, that had appeared in um, Harper's, I think. And um, his publisher was so thrilled with what he had done uh, with the Holders catalog that they gave him a book. He put those two articles into the, together into a book and wrote an afterword, and that was the first modern use of the phrase personal computer. And um, I mean, I, I've actually tracked this back. In fact, I think there was an HP ad in Scientific American in the 60s or maybe even 50s uh, that used the word personal computer, but they were talking about a calculator, which wasn't pro pro programmable, so I don't think that counts. Um, so in 1984, um, Stephen Levy had written a book called Hackers, uh, Heroes of the Computer Revolution. That's, that's Stephen down on the bottom with the glasses. And um, Kevin Kelly, who was a protege of Stewart's and was an editor at Coalition Quarterly, decided that they should have an event to bring all the hackers together. And so Stuart and his wife, Ryan Phelan, and Kevin Kelly organized this event and brought 150 people together in Marin County. And uh, this was Stuart standing up to respond to something that Steve Wozniak had said about sharing information. And what we heard was Stuart say, information wants to be free. Um, that's not what he said. He said information wants to be expensive because it's so valuable and information wants to be free. What he was actually doing was channeling Gregory Bateson. Bateson, of course, is the person who coined the idea of the double bind, a paradox. You can't win for, you can't, you can't win for losing. Um, and if we'd interpret what, what uh, Stuart said as a double bind rather than as a rallying cry for the dot-com era, the world might have been very different. Indeed, in the, in the, um, during the dot-com era, Stuart actually turned away from computing. Uh, that's Danny Hillis in the foreground. Danny Hillis was a supercomputer designer. And he approached uh, Stuart with the idea of building uh, a clock that would run for 10,000 years. Um, the clock, of course, is not a computer. It's not a Turing machine. Um, but the, I, Stuart was feeling that the dot-com era had become a bit of a grind. One of the, 
interesting things about him is that he tends to think outside the box. He tends to go where others aren't. Um, there's a bit of brand family, family wisdom. Um, throw a brand into the river and they'll float upstream. I originally wanted to uh, name the book Floating Upstream. And, and so that's, that's exactly what Stewart did. It was not well received in Silicon Valley and it's still controversial in the valley. Um, Everybody be quiet for a second and then stay quiet for 15 seconds after the bell rings. All right, um, as soon as you put a little bit of quiet, then give us a good strong ring. We didn't hear that at all. <laughs> <laughs> so when Stuart and Danny uh, proposed this idea initially at, at a hackers conference, it was, it was not well received at all. The, the hackers wanted to just look forward. They didn't want to look back. Um, but you know, finally, I think Stuart's ultimate contribution has been that he's consistently allowed us to reframe the way we look at the world, um, whether it's seeing the whole earth or uh, understanding personal computing. So thanks, let, let, let me talk to Nicole now. That's great. Thank you so much, John. Uh, now I'm going to introduce Nicole, uh, author, best-selling author and former journalist at the New York Times. Uh, her book, This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends, about the global cyber uh, arms race, was uh, chosen as the winner of the Financial Times and McKinsey Best Book of the Year last year. Uh, she's now also a guest lecturer at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. So please welcome Nicole. Glad to have you here. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Good. Uh -oh. So it is just wonderful to be here in person. It really is. You can just feel the vibration of being in a room with actual real life people. <laughs> so thank you for having me. Um, I'm going to embarrass John just a little bit. Um, he is hands down the most humble person at the New York Times. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to just uh, tell you a little bit about sort of the insider's view of John. I succeeded John at the New York Times in covering cybersecurity. And I think I was, I was there for 10 years until last December, and I always sort of thought of myself as John's annoying kid sister. I was always asking him, you know, how do you organize your sources? Or, you know, um, what, who, who is the godfather of cyber war? <laughs> and he was just so generous with his time and his contacts and his advice. And he really set the tone for the Silicon Valley Bureau of the New York Times. Um, and there's, there's literally a chapter in my book called The Godfather of Cyber War. And Markov is directly responsible for that chapter because I was sitting at my cubicle one day, ruining the day I ever sold a book and saying, who am I ever going to get from inside government to talk about the history of cyber weapons inside the US government? And Markov heard me, and he said, oh, you should just call the godfather of cyber war. <laughs> and he did this thing that most journalists do, because we learned, you learn so much as a journalist that you, your memory starts failing you. And he says, I don't remember his name. He worked at Sandia. I'm sure you can find him. And sure enough, that's all it took. I, I googled Sandia. Godfather of Cyber War, and after about an hour, I found some little Sandia newsletter about the retirement of someone whose career was pretty much redacted, but they had won more intelligence awards and had been stationed at these various agencies during key uh, cyber weapon development. And so I, I mentioned this story only to say that as I was reading Whole Earth, I was thinking, wow, Markov is really the Stuart brand <laughs> of, of tech journalism. Um, and so it was fitting that he would write this book. So 
you know, reading this, I, I grew up in Portola Valley, and John grew up in Palo Alto, and reading this as a Silicon Valley native, you can't help but feel like you've been oblivious for a very long time to the impact one man has had on your life. I mean, not just personal computing and hacker culture, but wow, some of the people and places he's influenced. You mentioned Jameis McNiven. I grew up with Jameis's boys, Bucks. He wouldn't, Bucks wouldn't be here without Stuart Brand because it was reading the Whole Earth Catalog that he was able to teach himself to do basic construction work. He ended up being a contractor for Steve Jobs' house in Saratoga, which brought him down the peninsula. And then he ended up starting Bucks, and now we have Bucks. I mean, it, it just like the story repeats itself over and over again. Even just your favorite, my favorite bands, Grateful Dead, Talking Heads, Brian Eno, and Stuart Brand had this wonderful relationship you document in the book. Um, and so on and on, you just realize that this person has been sort of almost like the wizard behind everything we see and do here in Silicon Valley. And only in this book did I realize the impact this one person had had on my life. So I wanted to just start by saying, you know, sorry, I have to say one other thing, which is I also started having these thoughts reading this, like maybe Stuart is Satoshi, not <laughs> Satoshi. <laughs> or at least Satoshi and Stuart were in the same room a couple times, you know. Um, that was the impact of the, the whole Earth catalog. So I want to ask you, you know, why do you think he repeatedly showed up so early um, you, you, uh, Dan alluded to it, but you, you said you kind of toyed with this idea of calling him a high IQ Forrest Gump, yeah. but that doesn't really get to it because you can only be in the right place in the right time so many times. He was there over and over and over again, and there's this certain undefined genius to it. So what do you attribute that to? Well, and before I start, since we're going down this path, I have to say that it's been about a decade, a little more than a decade, um, since you took uh, my p position. And she was basically on the front page of the New York Times almost every day for the <laughs> entire decade. I'm only slightly jealous about the job that Nicole did. But um, so uh, Stuart, the way Stuart explains it um, is that in high school, he realized there were lots of smart kids and it was really hard to compete. And he picked this you know, interesting sort of MO is if you go to where they aren't, um, you've got a wide open space. And so that's kind of true. Um, he gets bored very quickly and moves on to the next thing. That's kind of true. So that, you know, he'll, he start think, he, he's good at starting things. He doesn't stay for a long time, over a long period of time. Um, when he, I, at one point, I, I went back to the place where he summered, Higgins Lake in Michigan. Um, there was a family encampment. Um, and I got to speak with a couple of the kids who grew up with him, now in their 80s. And um, they used to call him Screwy Stewie. And they called him Screwy Stewie not because, you know, any app, they didn't dislike him or anything like that. He had an insane number of, of ideas. And every, one of, every once in a while, one of them was good. And I think a combination of that explains why he was in the right place consistently over a long time. Although I don't think any of them is sufficient to explain it. You are sort of the consummate biographer here. You, you don't see, we don't see you in this biography. There's no eyes or me's or here's where we met. So can you take us through the first time you met him at this hacker conference in Las Vegas, right? 1984? That was actually the first time I remember speaking with Stuart, although it wasn't the first time I remember seeing Stuart. And actually, the weird thing about reading his journals is even when he was at Stanford, I would see things that I recognized. Um, so the very first thing, actually, as long as we're getting into Silicon Valley history, um, Charles de Gaulle came here to get a tour of, um, of the industrial park in, I think it was 1960, maybe 59. And it was a big deal. And when his motorcade left town, they actually came down Waverly Street in Palo Alto, just roaring down Waverly Street. And I have a very clear memory of it because de Gaulle was in an open limo and it was so striking to see him. And also the neighborhood kids, the Steinharts, they were older than me. Actually, one of them dressed up as Napoleon lay in the gutter. And so <laughs> that, that had this big impact. And, and I was reading Stuart's journal and he was, 
you know, he studied um, two species of tarantula uh, for his master's, uh, for his undergraduate thesis at Stanford. He was driving out uh, to Searsville Lake on that same day, and the, the gull's motor came, <laughs> came by him. So that was the very first reference. Um, the second time, the first time, I, and so I was in the Holder's truck store a little bit. I, I would show up there, but it was not like, it, it was not magnetic to me. I remember it. But then, um, I went to work for this little weekly, of, the first weekly of the personal computer industry. It was my first job. Um, I had been a starving freelancer for a half a decade here in the Valley before I got that job. And I was at a Comdex in probably 82 or 83. And I had been invited to a party for the Epson printer division. This audience will probably appreciate that, which was in a hotel on the Strip. And I was standing in front of the largest bowl of cooked shrimp I'd ever seen in my life. And on the other side, there was Stuart Brand. And um, I went, oh, I get it. Because you know, I wouldn't get it for a while, but John Doerr ultimately said that um, personal computer industry was the largest legal accumulation of wealth in history. He said that again about the internet, but the first time he said it was about the personal computer industry. And so I immediately understood that we were both being sucked into this vortex. And of course, in Stuart's case, it didn't have a happy ending. Um, his agent had talked him into a software version of the Whole Earth Catalog, the Whole Earth so Software Catalog, which got the largest trade advance in history and then failed miserably because it was just the wrong thing. So he wasn't always in the right place at the wrong time. Someplace he was, he was at the right place at the wrong time. But the first time I really met him and got to talk to him was at the first Hackers Conference. Yeah, that's true. And then how did the biography come about? I mean, for me, Writing a biography would be terrifying, but writing a biography of someone who's still alive <laughs> would be even more terrifying than writing a book about cyber weapons. So how did, how did yeah. this come about? And, and tell us a little bit about. Well, I was unhappy at the times. So it was time to, to leave. I'd been covering um, AI and machine learning for a decade, and I wanted to do something else. And it was, it was just time to move on. Um, and. Uh, Kevin Kelly, um, who had worked at Co Coalition Quarterly and was close to, to Stuart, came to me and said, um, you know, Stuart has been thinking about an autobiography for some years, and he's finally decided he doesn't have the energy, which wasn't true. He, you know, he had a lot of energy. He didn't have a, the energy to muck around in his, his own life. And, and, he said, you know, and Kevin said, somebody should write his, his, his biography. You should do it. And I thought about it, and for about four different reasons, it seemed like an interesting project. I mean. Once again, you know, I just I, I, I talked about how how the I mean I'm I'm focused on this puzzle of why Silicon Valley happened and when it did and and why it did and he was part of that puzzle so that was interesting to me although his life extends on in many directions on both sides of that and it seemed like an interesting uh, new kind of challenge uh, to write a biography I hadn't done that and. Um, and so I, I did and you know it turned out Stuart has plenty of energy he was. Uh, he was uh, doing CrossFit classes when I first met him at 79, and, uh, and, and now he's, he's uh, involved in an, an, another book of his own, and so he's got lots of energy, just not for a for Did you give him veto power? Did you let him No, that was, uh, no. So it was all my book. Uh, it was all me. Stuart, you know, this is not an authorized biography or anything like that. Um, Stuart was a completely open book. He's, uh, you know, people talk about him being a private person, but in terms of our interaction, I mean, first of all, I didn't have a day, go, a day job to go back to. I've written my other books quickly because I wanted to get back to the times, and so I was slower. Uh, I spent a year and a half uh, reading his journals and letters and documents at the Stanford um, Library, and so our interviews were sort of paced by that, and. I ultimately talked to him 76 times, about a half, a half day's time. And, and it was, you know, I'd, I'd root around in the Stanford Library and then I'd go up and talk to him. So that was, that was actually a lot of fun. I think he enjoyed it too. And Can you talk about what it was like to go through the physical material, the journals? I mean, you said, sort of followed the Robert Caro motto yeah. of read every page. And then you had to go through just his digital life. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, the turn every page thing is, is really nice in theory. And I diligently tried to turn every physical page, but I crossed that, you know, there's a phase change as you go from the print world to the digital world. And the digital world is a complete mess. It's a disaster um, in so many ways. Stuff is lost already. Um, Stuart's email at the well, the well lost a lot of their email. And so that will never come back. 
Um, Stuart kept his mail in, in something called MBOX format. That was a disaster because the Mac OS did terrible things to the file, and the Stanford librarian spent a month or two trying to help me sort it. Well, we thought there were three quarters of a million messages. We never found out how many messages there really were. Um, there aren't good tools uh, yet to, to look at digital information, um, and so I, you know, I accumulated everything in an Evernote file, and that became overwhelming at a certain point. The other thing that's really interesting is when you cross that boundary, the way people communicated changed. And so all those wonderful letters home and the sort of taking time and reflecting, that's all gone because of the pace of email. Email changed the way people communicate, and I think it was a loss. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, there were some challenges in, in doing that. I think maybe in another half decade, there'll be better tools, there'll be better ways of archiving things. I mean, just today, I mean, this is how, how bad things are. Um, I still have a New York Times email account, and I got this message that I, they gave us two days. I sent the message out on Tuesday. I saw it on Thursday because I still occasionally look at the New York Times account. They're flushing everything more than 10 years old. It's gone. And they give you two days to do something about it. And, and, and so anyway, don't get me started. I, I, <laughs> I, I also have my New York Times email. And I also saw the message 15 minutes before it got on stage. And I was thinking, well, um, the well. Let's talk about the well. So the well was basically a, a very early primordial Twitter is how I started understanding it as I was reading it through your book. And you know, it was this online community, but you, but you sort of describe how ultimately, almost inevitably, people start getting upset, people start comparing each other to Hitler. <laughs> and it's sort of like, you know, you, you look at that, and I know that you, you write that Stuart considered it a failure, but I was thinking, why didn't we pay closer attention to this failure yeah. when we set up Twitter yeah. as our main mode of, of news gathering and conversation. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I put myself in that category. I mean, I have this, uh, in 1985 when he launched the well, and, and the amazing thing, I mean, this is another example where this thing percolated for a really long time before he started it. You see in his journal, uh, while he's hanging out with Engelbart in 68, Stuart cooked up this idea of something he called E-I-E-I-O, which was the well he conceived of it in 68, and he didn't get around to doing it until 1985. Um, he had some experience with online stuff. There was an early online system called Eyes that had kind of a relatively esoteric community uh, around it. Um, and then he met this guy, Larry Brilliant, and Brilliant funded him to, to set up the well. Brilliant thought it was going to be just another electronic whole earth catalog, and Stuart wasn't interested in doing that. He was interested in communications. Um, but the funny thing, and it, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, and, it, and, and I understand it completely. He was interviewed by KQED Focus magazine in, in 1985 when he launched the well. And there's this giant pull quote which says, uh, where Stuart says, um, communicating by com computer suppresses your animal urges. When you communicate by a computer, you communicate by, like an angel. <laughs> and, you know, so... You didn't, you didn't and, get it at but, all, right? And, and, you know, it's easy to poke <laughs> fun at him, but I have to say that I believe that at this point. I mean, the, the crazy thing is, I was reading all the cyberpunk science fiction. You know, I, I, I read Gibson, I read Stevenson, I read Vinge. I saw this sort of dark vision that the science fiction authors have. And at the same time, I believe John Perry Barlow was right, that this, you know, there would, could be possible to have this utopian abode, you know. What didn't we get about what we were reading? And I, so I'm, I'm sympathetic with Stuart on that. You just used the word percolate. And throughout the book, you, you talk about there, he had this one idea, and he didn't really do anything with it, but it bubbles up later, and, and he finally does something with it. And it's just clear he has this attention span. And as I'm reading the book, I'm thinking, does anyone today have this attention span? Because we're constantly getting interrupted with notifications and news, and we're all moving on to the next thing from five minutes ago. And you just wonder, do we even have the bandwidth to let things percolate the way that they did for Stuart yeah. Brand? Yeah. I, you know, he's, he's in, first of all, he's one of the best read people I've ever run across. He has this immense library, and he gave me a two or three hour tour once, and He'd read all the books in his library, and he could, he could remember them, and he could tell you what was in them. Also, even if you think about his work style now, it's, it's kind of interesting. He's on Gate 5 Road. He's working relatively in the same place he's been for the last 30 or 40 years. It's very ramshackle. 
um, you know, he's got this notion about low road architecture and he really lives that. So he's got this funky study, um, which is a reading room and a, and a work room, but then his, his computer office is literally across the courtyard in this dry dock ship that is literally half fallen into the earth. I mean, it's the most, and he's got a Macintosh in there, but he's set, the fact is that he's separated these two spaces, and I think that gets at it a little bit, that he has this place where he's not tied to computing all the time. Can you share a little bit about how the, the idea for the clock came to be? Oh, well, yeah, that's, in, uh, yeah, so Hillis, um, you know, he, he was running this supercomputer co company called Thinking Machines, and he was tied to this process that became here in the Valley in the 1990s. We began to refer to it as internet time. Things aren't just getting faster, but they're getting faster, faster. And we were celebrating that. That was, you know, that was Andy Grove's mantra. And um, Hillis was upset about that. He thought that something was being lost in that commitment to acceleration. And he sent out a letter to probably 40 or 50 of his friends. He took some reporters like me on long walks and tried to explain this idea to him, and I didn't get it at all, which is embarrassing to me. I think Stephen Lieber was the first one to write about it. Um, and Stuart was the only one who answered him. Um, Stuart sent back a note saying, you know, if you're gonna build a clock, you need a library. Because Stuart, at that point, thought that libraries played an essential role in the continuity of civilizations. And he thought that building a library to go along the clock was important. And so the, they began working together. It's still an extremely uh, controversial idea. I, you know, I tell people a lot about it. A lot of people are very skeptical about it. I visited the clock, which is almost finished. And I, when you see it, I think you become much more sympathetic. It, I think of it as, as, you know, the things that I've seen around the world, it's one of the most interesting things I've ever seen. And, you know, Hillis did as a provocation. He wanted people to think in a long-term way. And um, given what we're facing in terms of climate and stuff, it's probably not a bad idea. Well, to me, it really is sort of like, why haven't we seen a picture of the, the whole Earth yet? The clock is a reminder to this generation that you need to be thinking 10,000 years out, and no one is right now. Yeah. Um, my husband, actually, if, I, if this was in the book, I'm sorry I missed it. My husband told me this morning that Brian Eno is actually, he's creating the sounds and the chimes for the clock. Yeah, yeah that, Hillis and Eno, um, which I haven't heard yet, that's the, you know, there's gonna be a reveal, um, but, but um, uh, Danny spent a lot of time on the sounds of the, the clock we'll make. And of course, the deal is the clock will keep time from the differential and air pressure. But in order to tell the time, there's an observation room at the top. And, you have, and you, the only way you can get into the, to the clock is by entering at the base of the mountain and walking up this, this spiral staircase that's been chiseled out of the rock face. And halfway up, there's this platform. And you have to turn the levers to to make the clock show whatever they've got to show. I haven't seen that yet. Uh, we were just talking about this backstage, but we were asking the question, which was, is Stuart an elitist? Would he be seen as an elitist? And I don't think so. I don't get that impression reading the book, but you know, it's clear he was able to escape having a nine to five day job because he was still having money come in from trusts. And you can just see the headlines today. You know, if, if, if Stuart was starting out today, you know, like Trustafarian logging air tries to solve climate change with nuclear power, you know, you could just see the way that that would be perverted. But what do you think about? Well, first of all, my, one of the first things Stuart told me is that he had upper class roots. And if you look at it, pro forma, he really does have an upper class background. He comes from Michigan wealth. Um, and you know the family summered in uh, in the center of Michigan at Higgins Lake in a, a camp that these four families shared. Um, but it's more complicated than that in an interesting way. Um, Stuart um, actually grew up in Rockford, Illinois, which is about 60 miles uh, um, west of, of Chicago, and he had very very Hemingway-esque kind of upbringing. You know, Hemingway summered at Walloon Lakes. Stuart did the same. But if you go to their family home, first of all, his parents who were well-educated at Vassar and MIT. His dad was trained as an engineer, but ran an advertising company that he created in Rockford. They moved there to be away from the families to get some independence. And if you went to their family home, which was on Harlem Boulevard, a very, the home was very middle class. I was kind of struck. It was not an upper class home. It was 
kind of tight, everything was sort of constricted. And what was striking is the upper class homes in Rockford were one block over. They were on National Avenue and they fronted the river. And indeed the brands had bought this piece of property was up the river and they planned to build the family home someday so they could have a grand home like the other grand homes, but they never did. The money from the family went to the kids' education, which was a pri priority. And in fact, you know, Stewart's, if you talk about the trust fund idea, I mean, I looked at that very closely. He was wealthy in an as-needed way. Stewart never got more money than he needed not to get a day job. And he spent that period in the 60s kind of following whatever kind of crazy notions he had, and it gave him just enough to stay, to, to not take on a career and sort of go in different directions. So it was, it was, it was great, but it was not the way we think of, of wealth today. There were no Ferraris, there was no yacht, there was nothing like that. Can we talk about his, his turn of thinking on nuclear power? Yeah, yeah, so, so Stuart um, in his Coevolution Quarterly Days um, was what he thought, described as being sort of lightly anti-nuclear. And he was close to Peter Schwartz, who'd been a futurist at SRI and then went to work for Shell. And uh, they, uh, during the GBN period, the Global Business Network period, um, they got money from the Pentagon to study abrupt climate change. And they came away thinking that it was possible that, that severe changes in the climate could happen in a very compressed time frame. And in that kind of a situation, you don't have enough time to decarbonize. And they saw, they, Stuart and Peter and those guys decided that the only way you could get across that chasm was with something like nuclear power. And um, he's stuck with that. Um, it's still not popular in the environmental movement, although it's interesting that the nature of the debate has changed through Fukushima and everything else. Um, you know, now <laughs> my, my climate friends who are serious about this basically are anti-nuclear because they think we don't have enough time for nuclear, which is very different than where we were before. We, we don't have three, if you, you know, read COP26, we don't have three decades, we have one decade. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that's an extreme climate emergency. But Stuart, I mean, you know, he, he considers himself a pragmatist. He winces at the um, being called a utopian. Um, and he's willing to change his mind. He now acknowledges that solar and storage have come much more quickly than he expected when he wrote Whole Earth Discipline. And he's aware that, you know, these other technologies might be able to solve the problem. Someone who really, as I was preparing for this event, I started doing more reading. I, I watched Pandora's Promise, which is a great documentary about these activists who were anti-nuclear and then became pro-nuclear once they, once they got into it. Um, and did he convince you that nuclear is our way out of climate change? No, I'm still sort of, um, you know, if it, it's way too technical. The small, the small modular reactors um, might be a path forward. I think uh, he convinced me of that, that it's worth thinking about. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've mellowed on it, but once again, you know, time is incredibly short and the nuclear regulatory capital costs are big and the regulatory process is hard and it's just challenging to get across that, that chasm. I want to land on this question. It's a little provocative given the audience and where we are, but is another Stuart brand possible right now in this Silicon Valley that we're living in? Um, just with the costs and, you know, I did a store, I, when I moved back here, I was in Sausalito actually and um, moved back to Portola Valley, and I said, you know, why aren't there more new restaurants coming up? And I realized it's staffing. A lot of the people that you would hire at these restaurants or were working there went to go work at the tech companies and catering where they could get all of the Google perks and Facebook perks, and it's really hard to hire, and that's why you see grab-and-go places everywhere now if, if there are new restaurants or there are chains. And, um, you know, it's really closed off opportunities for the middle class. So is, is, is Silicon Valley still a warm home for the Stuart yeah. brands of the world? So there's, I mean, I've spent a lot of time thinking about um, the future of Silicon Valley. I mean, that's one of the, so um, there's the question of sort of why did Silicon Valley happen here? And there's a, you know, there's a rich discussion about that. But then you think about competition and can Silicon Valley to sustain itself and not become Detroit? And, um, you know, in 2000, and, 
I guess it was 2005 and 2006, I was doing a lot of reporting in Europe about mobile computing, and it really seemed like the center of gravity was shifting away from the valley, and there was Nokia, and, and the, you know, the operating systems were over there, and then all of a sudden the iPhone was introduced, and the center of gravity moved right back to the valley. And machine learning has happened here, and the center has stayed in the valley. But I went to China at the end of 2016 and spent time in Beijing, and at that point, I was just startled because, you know, after um, Trump, Peter Thiel uh, was in a, a roundtable discussion and he was basically saying that he thought the Chinese just stole. And um, when I was in Be Beijing, I saw the one thing that they stole. Um, they stole the culture of Silicon Valley. Um, it was alive and well and thriving on the third ring of Beijing, except at a scale that I couldn't even begin to understand. I mean, right now, the Chinese government has mandated that they compete in semiconductors, and there are 50,000 semiconductor startups. And even if 49,000 uh, of them are corrupt, there's a scale thing going on there. And I've, I, I would love to go back to China, because I heard that after that sort of thousand flowers bloom period in Beijing, there was a period of repression, and that was damped down. You saw that with all of the entrepreneurs being shut down. So I'd like to see what it's like now. But you know, you see it in the... Um, the fact that the Chinese are catching up very rapidly in artificial intelligence, we don't have the kind of lead we once did. The smart people in America who are looking at the, what China is doing acknowledge them as significant competitors. So what I think is that there's a good chance that the next big thing may not happen in Silicon Valley, and that, that's the indicator to me. Now, the, there's the second part of that question. Um, where do Stuart Brands come from? And I, I don't know that even having written his biography, I can answer that question, um, you know, part of its family. I, you know, at the end of the biography, I include these things I call brandisms. He had this incredible talent for, for coming up with aphorisms that are just, you know, that stick. Um, and I don't know where that comes from. So it's something about his... I was, I was flagging every page on the brandisms. <laughs> and so what is your favorite brandism? Oh, my God. <laughs> what, you know, I think pro probably the one that sticks to my mind is why haven't we seen a picture of the whole earth? Because I think that's so important. Um, many of them are more clever than that. But one of the first things he said to me, I visited him. He lives on South 40 Dock in Sausalito, but he doesn't live in a houseboat. He lives in a boat called the Marine. It's an old logging boat. And one of the first things he said is, um, live small so you can live large. And I thought that was very nice. And, Probably true. <laughs> we, we also didn't even mention that, you know, Steve Jobs spoke about the stay hungry, stay foolish quote at the, on the last Whole Earth Catalog, but it's the most misattributed quote to Steve Jobs. Yeah. <laughs> when Steve Jobs died, it was everyone was, was posting, stay hungry, stay foolish, Steve Jobs. <laughs> So here are some questions from our audience and I think also online. So it says, if Stuart would do something today, in 2022, if not the whole Earth catalog, what could it be? I mean, he's, doing, he's still doing a lot, but... So what he's working on now is a book on maintenance. Um, he sort of believes that maintenance is, is essential to the continuity of civilization. I think the, probably the best example of that kind of thinking is, you know, there's this famous story about Oxford when they noticed that one of the buildings on campus, the roof was wearing out. And um, we were, they had these huge timbers, and somebody pointed out that some forester 600 years earlier had planted a forest which had now come to fruition and was there to repa replace the earth, and that's the kind of long-term thinking that he was thinking about. Okay, this is a very interesting question. Brand early made the connection between LSD and computing. Today we see that interactive computing, video games, social media, have become extremely addictive. Did Brand ever see this connection? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, so the connection between LSD and computing. You know, he was, the 60s were a pretty druggy period for Stewart. He, he, he experimented with drugs all through the 60s. Um, I think he did um, get addicted, I'd have to say, to nitrous oxide. He found he didn't like LSD that much, although he continued to take LSD up until 69, where he took his last trip and walked away from it pretty much entirely. But there was a, a period uh, at the truck store where they kept a tank of nitrous oxide around. And you could basically have a, a very quick trip, and then it was called a, a, a work drug or something like that, because you could go back to work right after you, you tried it. I think that did really bad things to him. But whether he 
he saw the addictive, yeah, I think at the, at the end of the 60s, he'd seen that there, the psychedelics weren't going anywhere, that he'd taken that about as far as he could take it. Um, no one asked this, but I, I found that one of the most interesting people that was influenced by the whole catalog was Marlon Brando. <laughs> there was an interview with Marlon Brando where the whole Earth catalog was sitting by his side and the interviewer asked him, what is this? And, and he said something like, it gave me my stated purpose in life. Yeah. Do you know how? Yeah, Brand Brando, well, Brando wasn't around to ask about this, but Brando was a real supporter and believer. Um, he wanted, at one point, uh, Brand to move to his island. I'm blanking on the name of his island, but somewhere in the South Pacific. Um, and published the Coalition Quarterly for there. And actually, Stuart took a trip to the island. Um, you know, they tried to figure out how you could do all this without any electricity and stuff. They never, they never did it. Um, but uh, Brando saved the Coalition Quarterly at one point with a contribution. Um, he showed up in their office and completely freaked out um, the, the staff because it was a tiny little office and Brando was in his enlarged phase. And um, there's a very funny story about being picked up at the airport um, by Brando to, uh, to go to his home in, in LA and it was the, almost the most scary ride uh, Brando had ever had because Brando was absent-minded and he drove across town driving through red lights and ignoring everything. Um, so yeah, he was one of a generation. And both, uh, both Brand and Brando came to Native Americans, to American Indians early on in terms of uh, the activism of, of the Indians in that period. Brando was very active and Stuart was a little bit later, but also, um, you know, he created this multimedia show called American Needs Indians based on stuff he saw in the Warm Springs Indian Reservation where he realized there were things about this culture that were missing from his middle class white culture. And, can you talk about a little bit about his role at the Santa Fe Institute? Yeah, so they came to him um, in the 90s and he joined the board um, and he was an active board member. You know, he did um, sort of have two forays into architecture. Um, David Liddell, who was a Silicon Valley guy who was the president of the board at that time, um, had Stuart redesign the offices of the Santa Fe Institute and he took a lot of ideas that he'd taken away from people like Marvin Minsky at, the media, at MIT and applied them, and I think he was a very successful design. He also, um, he also designed, when GBM built offices in Berkeley, Stuart was in there and designed them, and I think he was successful in that. He sort of uh, took the early on the cave and commons approach to, to making office spaces that are workable and creative. What, what was Stuart's feedback on the biography? Um, he likes it. Um, you know, it's been called a friendly biography. I, I was conscientiously, you know, I, I, one of the reviews criticized me for not being critical enough, for, you know, not standing back and attacking Stuart. I set out intentionally, you know, um, I can't tell you how many articles there are about Stuart Brand over the years, profile articles, biographies. I mean, there are more than two dozen books that have biographical passages in them about Stuart, and everybody is using Stuart's life to make one point or another about something. And so I set out to let his life, to the degree that I could, stand on its own for good or ill. I wanted it to be a story that was readable. Um, and I sort of tried to park my biases at the door. And, and I think, uh, you know, Stuart appreciates that. I, I didn't go after him for one, you know, peck of dillo or the other. Um, there's 60,000 words that did not get into that book. Um, lots of good stories that I was very attached to, but um, I'll give them to Stanford and, and to the Computer History Museum. When I was writing my book, I asked Markov, what's the, how do you write a book? <laughs> and he said, oh, it's easy. You just follow the Bob Woodward way, you write, you wake up, you can have coffee, but nothing else, and then you write a thousand words and you don't do anything until that thousand word is done. <laughs> and so I asked him the other day, is that how you wrote this book? And your answer was? Well, not, you know, so it's also nice if you have a day job to go back to, so you have a, I've always been someone who appreciates deadlines, because I don't think I get anything done without deadlines. So this took me longer, but not that much longer, and, um, what I found that was weird, though, is so I was writing the book during the first lockdown, and you'd think, you know, this would be a great time to write and everything, and it, it turned out to be just the opposite. It was, like, super hard for me to work. It was like that I was writing um, Dormouse during 
And there was like three or four weeks where I couldn't do anything. And that's kind of the way I felt during lockdown is that there were a million ways to be distracted and sort of think about the end of the world and not <laughs> worry about your book. So it was complicated. But it, and it wasn't necessarily a thousand words. It was pick a word count, a daily word count. Woodward taught people, Woodward said he wrote to a word count. And that, that's always been an effective way to write for me. Not, not, on, not on newspaper dailies, but when you have a longer project. There's so much detail packed into this into the book, but there's so there's so much to Stuart Brand's life that what is the one thing that was left out of the book that you really had a hard time letting go? Oh God, Listen. there are lots of girlfriend stories that were really fun. <laughs> Let's hear them. Let's hear them. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Not on stage. <laughs> I was wondering about that because you do get into some of his sexual exploits through the book and I was just thinking, this is where I would really have a hard time writing this biography for someone who was still alive. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had a real interesting, I mean, there are two things that were, were interesting for me in terms of sort of my biases coming to Stuart. First of all, I was very aware that he was a member of the silent generation and I was a member of the baby boom generation. That became very clear that we had different worldviews. And that was, that was interesting. And the other thing that was interesting is that I soon, soon learned that he had a real antipathy for the new left. And of course, I'm your canonical new lefty. I grew up, I mean, you know, I, I grew up in that. And so um, I had to sort of, I had to sort of remember that, you know, my prejudices were not the way he saw the world. And that was actually really good for me. And, um, I, you know, he's an interesting, so here's a guy who calls himself a conservative, but he can't read the Wall Street Journal because he's so horrified by the editorial pages. So what kind of a conservative is that? Um, and, 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 you know, here's a guy who says he's, he, he hates the new left, and Abby Hoffman was his best friend. So what kind of an anti-leftist is that? And so, you know, there are these contradictions that are kind of fun. Do you think most of the antipathy came from the environmental movement? Oh, then? well, so that came later. Um, you know, I end the book on this, in this confrontation he had um, with his old friend, um, Peter uh, Coyote. Um, they'd, they'd been very close in the 60s, and uh, Stuart um, was defending his book in Berkeley in the Brower Center, which is sort of going into the, you know, in the, within the environmental movement, there are preservationists and there are conservationists, and Stuart clearly is a conservationist. And he was speaking to, to a, a group at Berkeley, and at the end, Coyote stood up and basically spent three, three, three minutes attacking Stuart. Um, and that, that dichotomy is, is, is very clear. The other stuff was, the other stuff was earlier. Um. I also wanted to know, reading the book, what came first, Stuart or Jurassic Park? <laughs> <laughs> the re-engineering, because yeah. we'll so talk a little bit yeah, about what so, he's been doing. Uh, with that was also, Greenberg. I mean, I ended the book at the point that they created Revive and Restore because I kind of wanted to separate biography from journalism. That said, um, you know, the woolly mammoth has gotten all the publicity, but the stuff that Revive and Restore is doing, it's mostly not about bringing back extinct species, it's mostly about pre preserving species that are endangered using advanced technologies. And they're doing, I mean, br bringing back, one of the things I learned is bringing back extinct species is hard. We do not have the technologies to do that, and it's not ever even clear that we'll ever be able to do it because, uh, you know, being a, being in a particular type of creature is both nurture and nature, and I, how do you recreate the environment in Pleistocene Park? I'm not sure we can do that. And also, I mean, one of the things that I, I really had fun stumbling across, um, one of the first butterflies to completely go extinct is a, a beautiful blue butterfly that lived in the sand dunes in, in San Francisco uh, in the 1940s went extinct because of urbanization, the Xerxes Blue. And there's an active effort now to recreate the Xerxes Blue. And I have no reservations about that at all. I mean, even despite, was it, it wasn't, um, who wrote the science fiction uh, article about the person who goes back in time and steps off the, Brad Bradbury, yeah. Uh, I think it's worth bringing Xerxes back. Uh, I think that's, that would make the world a better place. Okay, we are down to one of our last questions. So, as part of Computer History Museum's One Word Initiative, <laughs> you were asked to write down one word of advice for a young person starting out in their career 
Can you share your one word and the story behind it? Okay. So my one word is serendipity. And when I was thinking about it immediately, I was thinking, you know, it's, it's better to be lucky than good. But actually, there's, I, I think about serendipity often in the context of Silicon, my, my continual obsession about why Silicon Valley is here. Because, I mean, there's a rich debate about why Silicon Valley is here. And there were some very serendipitous things that came together to create Silicon Valley. For example, um, Shockley moved here because of his aging mother in Palo Alto. What if Shockley's mother had been in Kansas? How would the world be different? That was serendipitous. Oh, anyway, thank you. He is open to serendipity, though, in a way that you just don't see with many people these yeah. days. And you know, can you just last question, I guess? I'm always asking a, a last, final, third or fourth question here. But <laughs> how do you recreate that? Um, well, so. And once, let me answer by talking about Silicon Valley. I think one of the things we haven't focused on enough in terms of what makes the Valley tick is multiculturalism. Um, you know, I saw this when I came here, uh, when I came here to work. Um, you know, there was this moment when I was at Byte Magazine in 1984 where a friend of mine took me to this bakery in Sunnyvale and there were all these people in there with saris and these things on their forehead. And, and I said, what's going on? And what was going on was there was this new disk drive industry and there was a pipeline from the IIT in India straight to Sunnyvale. And um, you know, the valley has continued to be a magnet for the best and the brightest. And I, I worry that you know, that's a chemistry or a mechanism or a process that you could break. And um, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know how that directly relates to... No, I think you're right. Yeah. I, I went and did a stint in Boulder, and I, I left, I think, in part because it w lacked diversity. There were too many white guys with the five-fingered toe shoes on, <laughs> and <laughs> I had to get back here. Where's Sergey. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. It's really been wonderful. Thanks. That was fun. Thank you so much. Yeah, my. Thank you, thank you. John, Nicole, thank you so, so much. I thought um, it's just an exceptional conversation, so let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. And, and I, I'd like to close uh, by saying, first, obviously, remember you can go downstairs and see John and, and have him sign a book if you like. But. Um, you know, when I came here four years ago, um, this place was called the Computer History Museum, and it's still called the Computer History Museum. But one of the lenses that we've been working with is to take CHM and phrase it computing humanity and meaning and ask the question, what does it mean to be a human in a world of computing? And you end it on a wonderful framing, which is that it's really all about people and the culture that gets created, and within that, the wonderful things that occur. And uh, Stuart was clearly a catalyst, although catalysts disappear, and he has not disappeared. Uh, there's plenty to be seen, I think, in, in, in our daily lives that he brought about, or at least was present when those things happened. So it's a great illustration of, of what a person can do and the influence they can have on the world that we live in. And here in Silicon Valley, um, that's mostly about computing. And in the beginning, people were the computers. So it's all about us. Thank you all. Great.